My name is Jared Burrows, and I work at on Yammer uh, uh, at Yammer for Android at Microsoft. And this talk is uh, how to make your 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 build great again. So the main motivation for this is because uh, our Yammer app. Actually, so if you don't know what Yammer is, Yammer is a social networking service used uh, with communication within an organization. Currently, our development builds are multi-dex, but our release builds are single-dex. So we were able to make the consumer con consumer side, our customers, consume a smaller APK size with a single dex, which is really great. But how do we make our local dev builds faster and better, especially our CI builds, so we can iterate faster? Like I said, our current debug builds are currently multi-dex. Um, the more, for, more features we write, the more code we add, it slows down our builds. We all know this. And of course, the, our libraries get bigger over time, such as App Compat, which also slows down our builds. So let's go to some results. Uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout this talk, I'll talk about the different tools and techniques I use to help reduce our build times. And even to this day, we're still reducing. I found a few more key points before I wrote these slides on how to make it even smaller. So when we build our app from scratch, it takes about two minutes on a local debug build. But as we see here, it takes about, it used to take 18 minutes on a CI build with different build agents, which to me, I think is a horrible time. Now it's down to about 11 minutes now. We can still do better. But um, let me just go through this right now. So this right here is actually a simple debug, lint debug, test debug, and we currently build all of our special tests sharding. So we have several different build agents, several different emulators we're using. And so fixing and optimizing these build steps, I was able to reduce it by like 30 to 40%. So let's talk about what can we optimize. So first we have our hardware. We, have, we can increase CPU, we can increase the memory. Right? These are things that cost a lot of money sometimes. But what can we do with the software level? What can we do with Gradle? What can we do with Gradle properties? What can we do with the Android Gradle plugin? What can we do with you know, our actual IDEs? How can we optimize from the base up? So uh, this talk will be solely focused around the software part. I won't really touch too much on the hardware part. So what can we look for? We want, we want to look for all bottlenecks, uh, deterring startup tasks, in between tasks, uh, how builds start, how builds finish, anything that causes slowness. We want to find or remove uh, dependencies that are unnecessary and plugins that we don't necessarily need or use or use all the time. We want to check out how our module builds look as well as our build.gradle structures. Um, we want to optimize the Gradle DSLs that we currently have and focus on fixing those to make them faster. So where can we start? Uh, we want to start, like I said before, from the bottom up with our tooling. We want to develop better, we act, well, let me back up there for a second. We can buy better laptops and better CI, more agents, better emulators. Like I said before, that's, mem that's very uh, memory intensive very, it can be very costly. Um, one thing I didn't really touch on that I will mention right up front, we used to have several different emulators we'd run all of our sharded espresso tests on for our UI testing, but we recently moved to Genie Motion, which helped reduce about two minutes off our build times. So that has been a major help to us, actually. But like I said, this talk will be focused on the actual build, the build.gradle, and the Android Gradle plugin, specifically. So I'm going to go through and talk about how we optimize and configure our Gradle. That means Gradle properties, Gradle, uh, build out Gradle files, Android Gradle plugin specifically, that DSL, and Android Studio slash IntelliJ, depending on which one you're using. Let's, let's move on. Optimizing the Gradle setup. So one thing I always encourage people to do is you want to make sure you have the latest Gradle version. I know it could be a little difficult to update if, you, or if you're coming back from a 2.14 or 3.0 or 3.5, to make a ginormous jump to the latest and greatest 4.3 but I really encourage you to focus on doing that as they ensure compatibility between minor versions, which is incredibly uh, low risk to me. Upgrades are really easy. Always upgrades to me are really fast and help improve uh, build speed and bug fixes. I actively follow the releases and help try to contribute as much as I can. Um, they make transitioning easy. And one thing I highly encourage people to do, which I'm sure we're all doing, is that make sure we're at least using the latest version of Java, Java 8, uh, 1 8 specifically, even if you're targeting 1.7, uh, Java 7 for Android, um, which even though Android Gradle Plugin 3.0 has recently come out with these sugar, we can all now target Java 8. So start, starting from the bottom up, let's focus on the Gradle properties. These are the easy ones. These are the things we can easily add in and focus on that we uh, may or may not know about right off the bat. So the Gradle Daemon. If you're still using 2.14, you have to manually turn on the Gradle Daemon. If you're starting with 3.0 plus, um, you can easily have the, amount, the daemon on by default. Ideally for CIs, you probably don't want this, but for local builds, you definitely do. Um, if you're using less than 3.0, each time you run the Gradle plug, Gradle, or running Gradle Lou via command line or the ID, it creates a new instance of Gradle and will not run daemon as a daemon. But with 3.0 plus, it will. So we want to ensure that we can cut back on the JVM startup time by making sure that we do have this enabled all the time. So throughout this presentation, I'll be building out a Gradle.properties file as kind of like a little Thing that we can focus on and build together as we go through this presentation. And here's an example of our first property being used. 
So another major thing that we probably all know about is that the default Gradle only has about one gigabyte of RAM. Now you're saying to yourself, that heap space is plenty for you. But for Android builds specifically, you probably need a little bit more uh, RAM than that. That's not enough, especially for mul larger multi-dex projects, larger multi-module, uh, sub-module projects. As of, uh, as of Android Gradle plugin 3.1, which I'm hoping we'll release using that, uh, specifying at least two or more allows us to be able to use something called Dex and Process, which, you know, giving more memory to the Android Gradle plugin dramatically speeds up our builds. Um, so I really encourage you guys to play around with your JVM args. Um, for us, we, we obviously use a little bit more than two gigs. If you have a multi-dex project with, with several different modules, either Java libraries, Android libraries, and the actual Android project itself. Uh, like I said before, giving more memory dramatically helps increase the uh, dex completion. Go ahead and tack on our JVM args. So a minimum for Android projects, I definitely suggest at least two gigs. Another easy one would be simply turning on parallel builds. You can want to ex parallel allows you to execute Gradle tasks in parallel. Um, especially, this is especially helpful for multi-module builds. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more multi-module builds in a second or later down the road. Um, basically, if you can uh, compile more than one project at the same time and different tasks at different times, we can get through the project a lot faster. More specifically, though, you can actually inquire a little bit of scopes. If you want to actually kick out uh, your Java compile tasks into separate processes and your test tasks into separate processes, you actually can run these faster as well. And we do this in our builds as well. So here's how you turn on via the Gradle properties just for parallel. But what if we want to fork our Java processes? So this little snippet of code right here says that all tasks with the Java compile, we can configure its compile options to fork, which is true. So that way, if you have enough resources, you can kick out the Java compile process into separate processes and able to make it build faster. This is only applicable to Java compile tasks only, though, and then, at least in this code snippet. So one thing I'm a little favor of, I love running my tests in parallel, very similar to if you're using Gradle 4.0. By default, your dependencies download in parallel, so why not have everything run in parallel? In separate processes, I mean. But so this little snippet of code configures all tasks with type of test to run uh, in separate processes. So the Gradle Start Parameter Max Worker Count, at least on my laptop, returns eight, par um, eight max worker counts I can do but it may not want to use all the resources I possibly have on my machine. So what I want to do is check to make sure that if it's less than two, let's go ahead and default to one, which is normal, or go ahead and divide it by two and give us four. That way we're not using all the resources on the current machine, but we're utilizing a lot of them that we can build and test a lot faster. Uh, I added the fork every 100. That basically says to yourself, hey, I have a max of just 100 per worker that I can work on at a time. Um, if you guys haven't seen this before, you may have seen this. Snippet, it's exactly the same thing. Runtime, runtime available processors. But I like a tad bit better because it's a one-liner. I'm always, I always like less code that does the exact same thing. Maybe a little bit longer, less, maybe goes off the page a little bit, but uh, it's fine with me. Um, moving on. So here's an example of what it looks like. When, when you run a Gradle test debug, it kicks off uh, a single worker that executes all the tests on the same line. As you can see, executing 17 tests, that number will increment as using test, common example, some test. And it only shows one at a time. But what if we kicked off and added on one of these snippets back here? We can go ahead and here's what it looks like now. So we want to create a little test debug again, and we, we're running the exact same amount of tests, and it increments up, and now we're running four at a time. That way we have like 200 to 400, maybe hundreds of tests. Uh, a, great, a great example would be actually if you look at the Gradle repository uh, source code, they run their stuff in parallel as well because they have so many different tests they need to get through. It could take some time. So specifically for larger multi-module multi projects, I highly suggest running your tests uh, in, separate, in separate processes. All right, another easy win would be enabling configure on demand. So when you run a specified task and you have multi-modules that use different plugins, but you only want those modules with that certain task that you're running to run those certain tasks specifically, instead of iterating through all of them each and every time, you can turn on configure, um, configure on demand. So this is specifically helpful for projects that have multiple sub-projects. Um, it works really best if they're, if they're decoupled. So say if you have several different projects that don't rely on each other, or don't ha necessarily have that many dependencies, we want to be able to say to ourselves, hey, let's only pick this task for certain modules and help, them, help us speed up this build process along. One very important note, I see this on Stack Overflow quite, quite, quite often, is uh, people may or may not uh, understand or, or may possibly abuse sub-projects and all projects. It's really easy to use. You, it's applicable because it applies to all projects. But the only problem is it kind of uh, negates or removes the benefits of configure on demand 
when if you're applying all tasks, all projects, but not necessarily need all those tasks specified to all those different projects based on the plugins that you're applying to those projects. A little bit of a tongue twister there, but uh, yeah. So you don't want to be able to, uh, you want to be very specific when we're adding on plugins and projects. And we'll get a little bit more of that a little bit down the road. So now we can add, add on to our uh, Gradle, that properties file that we're building on. So another easy one, so starting with Gradle 3.5 and plus, they added in build cache. I thought this was really cool, really helpful. Uh, if you're already using incremental builds, basically uh, Gradle will say, to, say, hey, we already built this, we can reuse these resources. But what happens when you switch branches? What happens when you pull out new code? You're forced to technically rebuild your Android application over again. Uh, so I would highly suggest everyone turn on local build cache. That way it remembers the previous results, even on clean builds. Specific things that it will remember. It's actually beneficial when you have different product flavors and build types that you're swapping back and forth, where basically all the outputs are almost the same, but you're changing like something in the manifest or something like in the resources. You know, especially when you're comparing like debug, nightly, prod, beta. You know, checking and you know, swapping out different things. Um, so one thing that we're not doing that I want to consider really doing is uh, working with build cache remote. So technically, you can set up a, a dedicated server that will work with your Git system and in your in CI system, and technically help you out. Every time you pull down changes, you can share changes between your developers, you can share changes between uh, you know, your, your coworkers. So say if someone's working on master or a specific branch and you change branches, you don't want to have to rebuild everything all at once, especially if your project's really big, you just want to build their changes. So technically, you can download their build resources and optimize your build and, and get their changes right away and just compile really fast and have that build cache locally. So by having it remotely, you can download it locally. I'm not currently, we're not currently doing this at Yammer, but it's something I definitely want to look into uh, in the future. But I definitely encourage everyone to turn on uh, Gradle's build cache locally. All right, so now we're done with the Gradle.properties for a little bit. Let's focus on the actual code. Let's focus on the actual Groovy DSL. So before I talked about all projects and sub-projects, I think people should apply a pl plugins judiciously. And what I mean by that is we want to really determine, do we need this plugin for this particular module? Um, something common I always see is that people will add on tons of plugins for all the different modules in the very root one, where we may, in particularly, may not need all of those uh, for all the projects. So similar to adding dependencies, you want to specifically pick which ones you need. And once again, uh, try not to use sub-projects or all projects, but unless you necessarily need to add all those plugins to all the sub-projects or all the, all, all the modules. So basically, limiting the scope will help you build up the speed on those builds, especially during configuration time. Yeah. So let's get into configurations. So uh, say if you just checked out a project for the first time ever, you run Gradle Lou, and it says to yourself, hey, we're configuring the tasks, we're downloading the dependencies, we're doing a few things here and there, it caches the build scripts off. That's really good and all. When you run it again, technically, it should be less than a second. Because what you want Gradle to be able to say is that it's able to iterate through all different projects together, check out your local dependencies and plugins, resolve them, and return back either zero seconds or one second. Um, so when you're configuring your builds, applying plugins, evaluating build scripts, and running after evaluate, all that time combined should be equal to the total configuration time of your current build. So if any of you checked out the Gradle Summit 2017 talks, Stefan has a really good uh, talk about this called uh, Android Performance Pitfalls. Um, he mentions that a configuration time of less than one second is good. And that is specifically for a huge a huge build, like many different modules. For applications that only have one or two, it's, it's, you should only have around 50 milliseconds. Um, so I thought this was really, it really stuck with me. I wrote it down, and I really said to myself, you know, Yammer's going to have very fast configuration builds locally. I want to make sure that our developers are building the code as fast as possible, iterate fast as possible, build, and, and then just, you know, repeat. So here's an example of using the latest Gradle 4.3. And I ran Gradle Lou, and it popped out build successful in zero seconds. I didn't run any tasks here, though, right? But it went through uh, the configuration phase, everything that I just talked about. Configuration after evaluate, resolve with dependencies, and it should be exactly zero. It should be really, really fast. But what happens when we have a plugin that may or not be that fast at you know, resolving in configuration time? How do we handle this case? So here's a code snippet where I have two basic repositories that we've probably all seen before, Google's repository and the Gradle repo. And we are applying the latest uh, release of the Android Gradle plugin and some special slow plugin, something dirty. I don't want this plugin. But with the necessary evil that we have to have for some odd reason, and I, can't, I, don't have either, I don't have access to the source code, 
I don't have an easy way to update it in a short period of time. But what's with the performance pitfalls that we can solve here? Now we see that we're going to be downloading it, and it's going to be added to our class path, and then we're actually applying the plugin in our build.gradle script. So we want to focus on these two lines here. Now say in our particular um, case, we don't always need this plugin, but, but only needs to run on the CI, or we need, it, we need this plugin and only reason, needs to run on debug builds locally, we can add something with a, like a Gradle flag where we can check to see, hey, are we on the CI or not? Then if not, we can simply put them behind the flag and only specify Gradle-loo-pci when we want to toggle on these certain plugins or not. Um, for our builds, we have several different plugins that do different things. Uh, uh, like we use a, a spoon, dot, spoon Gradle plugin. We also use a Spoon Gradle plugin that wraps that plugin. And uh, when it resolves um, tasks, it can add seconds to every single build. And you can imagine if you have like 10 developers and adds like 36 seconds every time you're on Gradle Loo, that's a lot of time wasted. A lot of people sitting there waiting for it to finish. And we really want to speed this up and we want to really remove this. So for our CIs, we only, we only toggle certain things on and off. This is specifically helpful for other things as well. You know, say if you're running check style or error prone, you don't want to run these, you know, these plugins that may add extra time to your local builds, you can toggle this on and off. Uh, for our build specifically, we have one for CI, we have one for Lollipop specifically to get rid of uh, uh, legacy multi-decks, I'll talk about that a little bit later, and for debug builds. So like we're debugging extra lint stuff, um, basic things that, uh, like error prone, static analysis, things that slow down your builds that may not need on every single build, but you definitely want it on the CI. Here's something I definitely want to talk about. I see this uh, all the time. So I'm sure you guys have seen this on open source GitHub projects or on Stack Overflow specifically. You'll see people, you know, they'll say, oh, dependency can't be resolved, or I can't find this dependency. Then one person will answer, did you try JSON, or did you try Maven Central? You know, did you try this repository, did you try that one? And I think it's very uh, important that you minimize the amount of repositories that your, that your greater builds iterate through. You shouldn't have to make an HTTP request and resolve and then check to see if you have it in the cache or not for every single one of these. So from my perspective and what I've seen in, uh, on Stack Overflow and GitHub, here are the, the top five uh, most used repositories that I see all the time. You have JSONer, Maven Central. The middle one is the uh, official Gradle uh, plugins repo. We have the, as of Gradle 4.0, you can use Google directly, or if not, you can override it. Maven, especially the Maven URL for Google specifically, and Jitpack. And one thing I didn't mention up here, I think that you should also use snapshot repository sparingly because every single time you run a build, you'll notice that when a new snapshot is released, it'll go ahead and iterate through that uh, snapshot repository, download the latest dependency snapshot, and plug it into your build. And that can add build times, add to your build times significantly. Especially if, if you don't have internet at the time, it won't be cached, and you'll be stuck indefinitely. So, Here's something really nasty. So I want to combine pretty much everything I don't like to see all in one as a most pure example. So we have all projects. So this specify even to the root project, we're iterating through all projects and all submodules, applying this repository block, we're applying JSON Maven Central, the Gradle repository, Google, and Jetpack all at the same time for every single submodule. And you may think to yourself, you know, yes, it works. It works very well. We, we're never not finding a dependency that we don't need or an update that we don't have, but we need to look, look on how can we minimize this to increase the speed when we resolve our build.gradle scripts. So here's, here's an example of how I feel about it. So JSON and Raymond Central kind of compete with each other. When you update, when you upload a, uh, pl uh, a plugin or a dependency to JSON, you can actually mirror that to Maven Central. And, but Maven Central uh, has been around for a very long time, it has plenty of dependencies. But JSON kind of mirrors Maven Central. And they both are pretty much host the, basically the same dependencies. So my personal opinion, you may or may not be able to look into that and say, do we really need both? As of you know, Gradle 4.0, Google has their own uh, repository that's built in the Gradle. It hosts the Android open source uh, repositories and Google's closed source dependencies, such as Google Play services, you know, your GCM, your location services. And then uh, for the specific gr uh, Gradle repository, we host the Gradle plugins. And this also mirrors dependencies from JSONer. And Jitpack is a very special one. Jitpack I've only used in specific cases where we need a certain dependency from a certain branch or a certain commit and they haven't released it yet or they haven't tested it yet and you want to be able to bring it into your build and test and see how, how it helps you, how it affects you. But this can take a lot of time. Oops, sorry. 
So let's go back to our example here. So we're iterating through all projects and applying this repository block to everything. To me, that's just too many repos. So what can we remove from here? I would say, let's focus on the all projects block. In my personal opinion, I don't think we should apply repositories, at least the same repositories, to all projects unless we necessarily need them. We don't want to resolve through these every single time. So let's go ahead and remove that. Let's lower the scope. So now we have repositories block for a single module, but my, you know, like a personal opinion, I think that we still are doing a little bit too much. That's five repositories. Do we really need to have all of them checking for your dependencies? So as I said before, JSON and Maven Central virtually host the same repositories. Now, my open source projects on GitHub, I, the libraries and, and Gradle plugins I publish, I've used JSON. It's really easy. Uh, it's really easy to use, and I can mirror it to Maven Central if I want. So let's go ahead and just use one of those. Let's get rid of Maven Central. So that's one down, but we still have more to go. What else can we do from here? We went from five to four. Now, in the previous slide, I mentioned that the Gradle Repositories plugin is for the Gradle plugin specifically, but their dependencies are mirrored from JSONer. So we can possibly look forward at consolidating, focusing on these two and consolidating them into just one. And that allowed me to get rid of JSONer. And now we just have the Gradle repo. Now we're down to three, two down, but I still say we can do a little better. So if you're not using Jetpack specifically, if you're not bringing in a specific commit or specific branch, and there are no snapshots available, um, we can go ahead and focus on that and possibly remove that. That way we're not iterating through that repository every single time we're trying to find a cache dependency or dependency that we don't have already. Uh, this is specifically helpful every time you update a dependency so it doesn't get confused when it iterates through. And to me, this is the most minimal as we can. Uh, for all the latest uh, Google stuff, they're no longer, no longer pu pu publishing to Maven Central or JSON or anymore. So you want to actually use the repository from Google directly, starting gr Gradle 4.0. And some plugins are publishing to Gradle repo directly in and out in JSON, but also JSON as well. And that first repository there, plugins at Gradle, mirrors both those. So this is the most optimal solution for the example that I gave. Uh, after we went through this, talking about subprojects, and all projects, and talking about how we resolve dependencies, let's step in up one step further. One common mistake I see on um, Stack Overflow quite often is when someone wants to grab the latest dependency of something, they always add the plus notation. That way you always grab the latest dependency, which is great. It does work. But similar to snapshots, every time you run Gradle Loo, there's not a, there's not a hard dependency check. So Gradle will say, to itself, hey, I got to reach out there and try to download the latest version. And that will add time to your builds because it makes the HTTP request, checks you if you have it in cache, and then it goes ahead and put, puts in your build, and then you build it. We want to uh, be very particular about what we're adding in and what we're doing and how we can make it better. Um, so uh, say you didn't know an update came out, but before you use a plus sign to get an update, but say you didn't know another update came out, you may have unexpected behaviors, uh, compilation issues, and of course, like I said before, slower builds when it downloads after, um, while checking for updates. So here's an example of using a library that I'm pretty sure we've all have used, the App Compat View 7 library with a dynamic dependency. I see this quite often uh, where someone says, or more specifically, it'd probably be more specific, like 22, 23, 25, and plus, or dot plus, where they're always grabbing the latest one. So how can we solve this? See, so I use something called the bin mains Gradle version plugin. I use this on all my open source projects. I probably even made a pull request to your project just to add it in. That way people can actually go through and iterate through the plugins and dependencies and pull in the exact latest releases that you actually need and not the ones that you're just grabbing via uh, the plus notation. Uh, instead of having to search for all of them manually you know, via Google, you can just use that plugin. And here's an example of what that looks like. So we run, run Gradle, we apply that bin mains plugin. I provide, the, I provide the link below. You run Gradle dependency updates and it lists out exactly what we have. We have that plugin that's applied and we have the app compat right there. Now, I chopped off a little bit of this in the previous, I chopped off a little bit of the output. In, in the previous outputs, it will show that it was downloading the POM files of each of these dependencies and actually bringing in and checking, oh, hey, this is the latest stable release. And then it creates a nice report for us each and every time. So now we can go back to our dependencies and add a, and a, add a static dependency and force it to resolve to 27, which is the, actually the latest as of recently, Android 8.1. So some of you may be asking yourselves, like, oh, I've done this many times. I've added you know, a, a, a dependency directly, just like you did. And Jared, you know, de you know, transit dependencies are still coming in and messing things up for me. Uh, where we used to see this a lot is before Espresso 3.0, Espresso would bring in extra dependencies, actually not extra dependencies, but a transit dependency of 
the support annotation libraries, and it would mess up uh, other versions that you had or had in different in different configurations. So, for instance, if you had a compile test compile and Android test compile, um, the Android test compile may have a different version of the support annotations than in your compile would. Because if you're using App Compat, like we see here, this brings in support annotations. But the Espresso library that may use may be an older version because they haven't been keeping up to date, but as of recently they have. But in previously, and this is an, just the next example, previously in older Espresso versions and 2.0s, pluses, you could have a lower um, support, annotation process, uh, support annotation library and it will mess up when trying to run Espresso tests. So we can do something like this where we iterate through all configurations. In this case, specifically Android test, but I'm just showing all for handling all cases in case you know, people want to actually use that. We use a resolution strategy and we force all dependencies with the same group and artifact ID to be 27. And that way it resolves this issue and you don't have any problems like this anymore. Excuse me. So when we do something like this, before and after, we can run Gradle Blue dependencies and check to make sure that all the channels of dependencies are resolved at the exact versions that we wanted them to be in. Moving on. So avoid unnecessary and unused dependencies. I also see this quite often on Stack Overflow. I try to answer as many questions as I can. When someone asks, hey, I have conflicting dependencies, or I want to just do this one little small task, I'll see people add in extra dependencies that they either don't need or don't know that come in transitively. Um, and sometimes uh, people coming from different backgrounds outside of mobile development will add in libraries that are just simply too big for no mobile development uh, specifically. And we may or may not actually need these for mobile development. It may be too powerful, too large. Um, I actually gave a different talk about that called The Road to Single Text, where I made Yammer's release APK single decks, and where it used to be uh, uh, two, three dexes sometimes. It was really, it was really, really big. Um, so I really encourage you to scan through your compile, and if you're using Android Gradle plugin 3.0, implementation configurations, and find out any extra and unused dependencies that you're not actually using. That way, this will increase your local debug builds. And when hopefully everyone's using ProGuard, when you export a release build, it'll make your release builds even smaller. So uh, basically, some of these dependencies, I'm not going to go too much into it, but something like Guava, for instance. I love Guava, especially if you're on like back-end Java development where you, you know, there isn't a deck size, there isn't a real long time compiling. Uh, I think Guava may be a little bit just too big for something so small, especially with App Compat and Google Play Services taking up most of your app space today. Uh, something like Jackson and JSON. JSON is just as fast as Jackson, except when it comes to much, much bigger payloads. But most of the mobile payloads are much, much smaller, ideally. Um, there's other libraries like Mashi or JSON they can use instead of using Jackson directly. I say this because Jackson, at least the latest Jackson, has like 16,000 including Jackson Databind and Compiler, those dependencies can go up to like 16,000 methods. And if App Compat is taking like 20,000 and Google Play Server is taking 20,000, you're already about to hit your first DEX limit. So I, I highly suggest you use something like Mashi, which only has 700 methods, or GSON that has like, like 1,400. Now bear in mind, these numbers are pre-DEX, which means they can get a little bit bigger, but also pre-ProGuard, which means after ProGuard, they can get, down, get trimmed down significantly. So one thing I didn't mention, before I mentioned, I talked about build cache. I talked about um, basically, you know, what happens when we build something. How can we reuse the resources? We need to talk about a little bit of incremental builds. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but something that we all love is incremental builds when it comes to pure Java projects. But a lot of us, when it comes to Android development, may use some fancy libraries from like Google, such as Auto Value, Dagger Two, um, Bumptex, Glide. They all use annotation processing, and that can kind of slow us down. So. Uh, just, to, just to show you how to in, uh, in, you know, turn on incremental builds. So basically, we want Gradle to go ahead and reuse resources that we already compiled to make it even faster. Uh, turning on Java compile tasks to specifically include incremental will actually only change the Java classes that were changed or dependencies that were changed. So let's look at that. So let's take our previous example with you know, tasks with type of Java compile where we were forking before. Let's make it even better. So we can go ahead and make it incremental where we're actually incrementing the builds and make and forking. Um, on previous, actually hold on a second. On previous builds, when we used to have this before, if you're using Dagger 2, I, th I think it was an Android Gradle plugin 2.3.3, it may still, up, may still show up in Android Gradle plugin 3.0. Though if you're running Gradle-I, it will actually say, hey, we're turning off incremental 
compiling for this module or this dependency because annotation processors were found within your class path, you know, such as auto value, dagger two. And I would say from a development perspective, I would much rather use dagger two to help build out my application to, uh, to be a little bit more modular and use dependency injection effectively um, and maybe add on a little bit more time. I know it sounds crazy, I'm all about speed, but sometimes there are trade-offs, pro and cons that we may, wanna, may or may not want to consider. Especially with the newer release of Android Gradle Plugin 3.0, builds have gotten significantly faster and we may not have to worry as much as we used to. So as I said before, libraries like Auto Value, Glide, Butter Knife, and Dagger all use annotation processing, which helps cut way of the boilerplate that we have to manually write, but it gets still added into our build, file, build folders. And I, I'm not sure, I, from my personal perspective, I, I don't think there's annotation processing support for 3.0, but I believe um, Xavier and his team are actually working on that for Android Gradle Plugin 3.1. I haven't had time, but they actually recently released Android Gradle Plugin 3.1 Alpha 02. I've been playing around with that a little bit, but I did not get a chance to update these slides right before that came out. But like I said before, even with annotation processing disabled or not, Android Gradle Plugin 3.0 is very fast by itself. So let's go back to our previous example. So say if you're using just a Java, uh, say if you're using some of these dependencies and you didn't really know. So, obviously I didn't list out all of them. Here's a previous example where we have Java, we're, we're looking at all Java compiled tasks for our, this particular module. It, they're already incremental and they're already forked. What can we do here to debug them? So we can do something like this where we iterate through and we actually get the effective annotation processor path and return a list of all the jars specifically that are, have annotation processors located in them and actually print them out for us to debug and possibly go through and ask ourselves, are we really using this dependency? Is there a way we can turn it off? And um, it's a good way to debug. Um, I believe Cedric from the, one of the guys from Gradle has a blog post around Gradle 3.4 or 3.5 where for Java projects specifically, specifically, not Android, you're able to take the Java compiler and use the effective annotation processor path, create a separate configuration, and, and compile the annotations, and use the annotation, um, annotation processor, processors in a separate configuration, which will effectively allow you to use something called compile avoidance and be able to take a next step and, and completely have incremental builds with annotation processors. I didn't have an example of this on that because it doesn't really apply to the Android Gradle plugin because we are at DroidCon. So let's go a little further. So how do we optimize you know, we, we talked about you know, our build at Gradle. We talked about build, uh, Gradle properties. How do we optimize our Android Gradle plugin setup, specifically the Android Gradle plugin DSL? But once again, I, I harp on this all the time, especially when it comes to Stack Overflow and people looking for the latest updates and latest fixes. It's very important to try and keep your software up to date. I know jumping from a, you know, a Android Gradle plugin to 3 to 3.0 can be a little painful, especially with the different changes and configurations, but I, I, I'm telling you, it's highly worth it. Uh, most people may have may or not made the, the jump to like Buck, other build systems, but um, I really highly encourage you to look at Android Gradle plugin, uh, give it a shot. <clears throat> also, keeping the Android uh, SDK tools up to date. We actually have a special Team City build job just for that, where every once in a while we'll run it and keep the build tools up to date. Because they'll have special patches and revisions that'll help fix bugs uh, that may or may not have been reported. It can help increase the performance of your overall builds and packaging of the APKs itself. So by keeping our SDK up to date, you can utilize, optimize, and build speed as well and bug fixes. So here's something I particularly don't like. I, I'm not a fan of product flavors. Uh, at Yammer, we, we used to have several different product flavors which would list out our debug, our prod, our uh, internal nightly, and beta. But it turned out beta and prod were virtually the same thing just pushed out at different, uh, different lengths. So prod was always two weeks ahead, or two weeks ahead of uh, debug, and beta was only one week ahead of debug. So with this being said, how can we minimize this? So I created a small little example. I don't want to write too much. I want to fit it on the slide here. So say we have flavor dimensions of dim, two product flavors, nightly and prod, and we have a debug and release like normal. How can we, how can we minimize this? All right, that's what I want to show you. Here we go. So when we run uh, Grail tasks, I'm just going to put a snippet up here. We always have an assemble and assemble Android test. Those are freebies that always come along. But for the actual debug and release, we have an assemble debug and assemble release in the two product flavors that we created uh, nightly in prod. But since we use flavor dimensions, it didn't attack on the extra tasks that it normally would. So I just want to minimize for this example. 
So say, in this example, that debug and nightly were the same thing. They're only used internally, but debug is not pro-guarded and nightly was. That way, you know, other people outside your uh, Android development team can use this nightly and report bugs. Uh, so say, like in the previous example I said, or this is one specifically, prod and release are actually the same thing, and we, you know, it's just that prod and release are the pro-guarded version that we actually release to the public that don't actually have any of the, like, raid shake or any way to report back any bugs that you report back internally across teams. So if debug and nightly are the same, except for ProGuard, and prod and release are exactly the same, how can we cut down these four extra tasks that are created to even smaller? So I'll, I'm a major fan, I don't know if you can tell by now, using Gradle uh, as a base. I like using properties. This is a little bit hacky, I would say, but it works very, very well. So this approach prevents Android Gradle plugin from going through and generating the extra product flavor tasks for every single plugin that you have. So the more plugins, the more tasks are generated. And I want to figure out a way to limit this. So an easy way to do this is say, if you have Nightly, we can turn on ProGuard, like we mentioned before, change the suffix to Nightly. Or if you're not using Nightly, it'll just default to debug right there. And then since prod and release, like we said, were the same, we don't really need prod at all. We could just use build types, and we don't need those product flavors at all. So we saved ourselves extra iterations, extra um, time configurating uh, new tasks. And if we want to use Nightly, it's very simple. No one's ever going to use it locally. You're going to use it on the CI. So the CI is going to run gradle-loo-p nightly, and it's going to spawn a pro-guarded debug version that you're going to be able to use internally uh, with your debug team as well as your te other teams to help report bugs. So let's look at what it looks like now. Now it looks like a normal build. You have your normal symbol and a symbol test, and only debug and release, the actual build types and no product flavors. We will cut down on the actual tasks by two, or if you're just looking at the actual debug release and the other two product flavors, technically by 50%, we cut it in half. Uh, Yammer, we used to have a lot more. We had flavor dimensions and more product flavors, and we wanted to figure out a way to, to every time we run Glade or Lou or we sync up with Android, Gradle, uh, Android Studio, we don't want to have all this ginormous chunk of tasks that we didn't use. How can we trim down on these product flavors? Now, most of you are thinking, oh, I didn't want to show the slide yet, but most of you are thinking, how do we do, you know, isn't there something built in? Doesn't Android Gradle plugin provide this already? And I believe that we did this before this came out, but they work either way. You can use something called Variant Filter, which comes in the Android Gradle plugin, which virtually does the same thing. You can add the product flavors back in, and then you can go through each variant and pick out the ones you don't want anymore. You can essentially trim those out. But my personal opinion, if you know which ones to trim out in advance, why can't you just add that step before with the flag? There's no point in generating these tasks just to trim them out in the end. So I think you can just use a flag as preventative care to move those out then after caring for it afterwards. So one major thing I really found helpful was the res configs. Uh, in a previous talk I did, uh, The Road to Single Decks, we found out that all the different libraries from Google Play Services, App Compad, all those different libraries that we're using, you know, basically any AR was actually bringing in other resources, in other languages, and other things that we weren't particularly using for our end APK, the actual APK that our consumers consume. So we can actually go through and trim and filter out localizations and resources that we don't necessarily need for our project specifically. And so how do we do this? Let me tell you, it's very simple. In the default config or any particular product flavor, but we're not using product flavors, um, uh, in, in the default config, we specify res configs. So here, it kind of acts like ProGuard, where we only want to keep certain things. In this particular example, we're keeping English. But obviously, again, we support a lot more than just English languages. We support many different languages. So we can easily just tack on more resources th than we already have. And, this, and once again, this only means that we're keeping these multiple resources, languages, or configurations. So one thing I saw, I, I see this sometimes at Growflow, I also saw it in our build once, and we want to fix this right away, is to make sure that we only use static constants for our builds. Um, a lot of times you'll see like developers would like to have you know, a build time or build stamp or, or like a git, you know, like some kind of like a git sha, where it shows that in the build.gradle and we'll actually show that in the app. That way, if you're walking around the app, you forget what build you have, you want to compare it to another developer, you're storing that kind of information, and you can send those in bug reports, or like pop up a dialogue and say, hey, here's what version I'm on, you know, here's what I'm experiencing something different than you are. It helps distinguish, and helps debug. Um, so using dynamic variables are helpful in that sense, but what else is it doing? When you dynamically change a resource, Gradle will pick that, detect that up, and rebuild the whole application again, and we don't want that happening. So this also breaks uh, instant run. So if you're changing things uh, dynamically, it will break instant run, and we don't want that happening because it's you know you're, you're basically negating the whole effects of instant run. So we want to use static values for debug builds. 
for iterations. You only want those dynamic build times or build stamps or get shots in actual release builds or prod builds or nightly builds. Things that you only build once a, a day or once every two weeks, just not over again. We want developers iterating as fast as possible. So here's an example of a basic uh, Android Gradle plugin build setup with the latest dependencies. It's just an example. And um, every time you run Gradle Lou, it's going to pop in a new date into that version code, which it, it seems great at first, but when you're building over and over again, you're having to build essentially all over again. This kills incremental builds, kills instant run. How can we optimize this? So we want to focus on this line right here in version code. So we want to put this behind a flag. What this flag says is that, hey, if we're going to be releasing, this is the only time we actually want a new date plugged into the new version code. Uh, you can optimize this in any way you want. We do several different things at Yammer, but this is a very fine-tuned example of where, you know, uh, even if the developer doesn't even know about uh, is release, you know, or dash p release, um, he can still, he or she can still just 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 run it over and over again and not have to worry about changing that, and then worrying about resources such as the Android man manifest being generated with a new value every single time and having to be repackaged into the app every single time. So this is one way. So this will only change if you actually type in greater lu dash p uh, release. And once again, this is something you can kind of defer to your build system, your actual CI. So you don't need to run this locally. You can test it locally, but the CI should really be focusing on this. Your debug builds should be speech for you, unless it's going to be a nightly you're sharing or beta or prod or any special flavor or build type. So one thing you will see on a lot of uh, blogs, uh, even the official Android source code uh, documentation, Android Gradle plugin source code documentation, they'll mention that if you have special things you want to break out of your main source and put into special libraries, Gradle can, will only compile the li libraries that you modify and will cache them effectively for build cache. We were seeing something quite different at Yammer. We were actually having a different kind of build setup where we had a common you know, Java module, we had an Android library module, and we had, had a few more Java library, mo uh, li li library modules. And they are all syncing together and going into our uh, Yammer UI module, which is our app module. Because all the libraries get compiled into the application module effectively anyways. So what, what ideally, you want to use separate modules um, that will help speed up and utilize configure on demand and parallel. That we can build in parallel and build different modules at the same time and tasks at the same time. And based on the tasks you apply, only configure those tasks to the specific modules. But in our example, we were not packaging by feature or by separate libraries. We were actually just separating our code in modules. And so after a discussion and a design architecture discussion, um, I was able to convince our team to reduce all those modules into the only modules that weren't touched at every single build. And we were actually able to shave off an entire two minutes of our build time by merging the modules um, together. Uh, we were able to still keep code separately, but we only keep code separately by Java packages. Now, there are special cases where this is negates itself. In our case, it works very well, but say if you were creating special features in special modules and separate sub-projects, you know, say if you had different UI features that you weren't touching that get compiled once and then they're cached off to the side and you don't have to use it again and it's not being touched anymore, then that right, ideally right there would be perfect to break out your code into separate library modules and effectively make your build much, much faster because you're not touching that code base anymore. But in our particular code base and the way we um, uh, architecture our current app, that was not the case for us. So this is something I really encourage you to play around with and test uh, whether or not it works out for you, whether it's breaking out separate modules you know, by feature, that way you can hot swap certain things or ch change out uh, certain things. If that works for you, that can greatly uh, increase, I mean, decrease your build times. So now, something else uh, to look into is uh, disable PNG and crunching. Say if you already... You say you have leftover PNGs and you can't move them to WebP, uh, go ahead and try using PNG crunching. Now, in Android Gradle Plugin 3.0, sadly when I was writing these slides, you know, Android Gradle Plugin 3.0 came out, uh, so this is only applicable technically to Android Gradle Plugin or any plugin less than uh, 3.0. You can disable PNG crunching. Um, but thank, you know, thank God they actually added this optimization in by default in 3.0+. So here's an example of disabling PNG and crunching. So if we're on the CI, we go ahead and say uh, true, because we want the cruncher to be enabled on the CI. But locally, you're going to rerun on this and you're not on the CI, so it'll be disabled by default. And it's going to help us uh, speed up our builds just a little bit more. So here's a huge win, something that we use. 
we avoid legacy multivex. So obviously we can't just bump our min SDKs to 21, so we need to add some kind of build flag in. So if your min SDK is less than 21 and you're using multidex, you're using the legacy multidex. If it's greater or equal to 21, you're using the really fast native multidex, which is much faster. Now on the official Google Docs, it says to use product flavors, but as I, as I explained, I'm not really too much a fan of having too many product flavors or even build types. I want to minimize the amount of tasks that we create on configuration time. So adding a one-liner to toggle the SDK between, like, say, 19 or 21 is much more effective in, in our case specifically. So let's take an example. Here's an example snippet of using legacy multidex. We have multidex equals true, but our min SDK is less than 21, so it's going to be a slow build. And when you're developing something, you want to be very careful that you don't use you know, something greater than 21 and then ship it if your min SDK is still 19. But in this case, we're going to uh, focus on min SDK 19 and so that, you know, the, we want to basically avoid the legacy multidex because of how slow it can be. So, very, very similar to other things before, I have, we have a basic property where we say if it does have, you know, we have, if we're passing in greater loo dash p lollipop, we can say, oh, it does have this property, it should return true, and it will use 21 as your minus decay. This will greatly, spill, um, greatly, build, uh, it will greatly reduce your build times uh, on your local builds. Ideally, you don't want this on your CI, so don't use this for your CI. That's why you use a separate. Um, a separate property, something called lollipop. And if, if no one specifies this, it'll naturally build correctly, just like the CI will do, and just be default 19. Another thing that you don't see much, but uh, still does affect us, is uh, dexing jars, which have to be converted to dex files. Ideally, one ginormous dex file, not multi-dex, ideally. Uh, to help speed up the performance builds locally, we want to turn on uh, pre-dexing. But for our CI, it kind of does the reverse. We don't need to predex the libraries if we're only going to build one time. We can go through and build as fast as we can. So how do we do this? We can go ahead and use our CI flag again and say to ourselves, does, if, our pro if our project has this property and it should return true on the CI, go ahead and negate it to be false. That way on the CI, we, we will not predex libraries and help, build, and help speed up the CI just a little bit more. Similar to build cache on Gradle, we, um, Android Studio, uh, Android Gradle plugin specifically, has its own build cache. Now, luckily, in Android Gradle plugin 2.3.0, it's enabled by default. So if anyone is sadly using anything below 2.3, you can still use this feature. So it, it, it basically improves performance of your clean builds by reusing cache files. And in, in the, I think it's like the .android cache folder is different from the Android cache. I mean, from the, it's different, the .android cache folder is different from the .gradle cache folder that you'll see that's generated in your root project level. Basically, stores certain outputs such as unpackaged ARs and predexed dependencies, and we just talked about predex in the previous slide. So here's our Gradle properties file that we've been building out through this entire talk. We're getting pretty big now. Let's go ahead and squash it together, though, make it a little bit more cleaner, and then we can go ahead and enable the build cache for Android specifically. So the next couple slides are based on new things that have come out. I was able to update these just recently. I have a test project where I'm always playing around with um, the latest. Android Gradle plugin. I'm a major fan of Gradle and optimizing builds. Um, something has introduced lately, re recently, was the uh, new Dex compiler. It's not called Dex anymore. It's going to be called the uh, D8 compiler. Basically, as I explained on the other previous slide, Dex compilation processes convert your dot your Java um, your Java compiled class file from dot class bytecode to dot Dex bytecode. Uh, Dx versus D8 it compiles faster and outputs smaller Dex files, which is incredible because I gave a talk on how to reduce the Dex files, and now you know, Google's taking this into account and is helping me with that and reducing the DEX size. Um, one other thing that really applies to this talk is the, um, it's, it's the same or even better than performance. So while you're making it smaller, it, the performance is still the same at runtime. So Android Grid Plugin 3.0, you can toggle it, which I'll show you very soon. And 3.10 Alpha 0, 1 and 2, you should really try it out. Yeah, even though it's alpha, you don't have to use it for pride, but I always like to test with the new tools in advance to avoid problems later on. It's enabled by default, which is really great. And since the, you know, the desktop file doesn't change on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a low-risk change to update. So here's our previous Gradle properties. Continues to get bigger. And now we can easily enable uh, the E8 compiler with 3.0 plus. Just to reiterate, the uh, Android plugin 3.0 has brought us a lot of great changes, and I think we should really dig into it and really utilize it. So, before we talked about the Gradle properties at the lowest level, then we moved up to build out Gradle files where we actually write some code. Let's move to the next level 
what's even more extracted at the actual Android Studio level. So we want to optimize your Android Studio usage. So we talked about PNG crunching, but recently uh, Google has added in a tool to convert our you know, PNGs, if not already converted to vector if not convert, converted into vector drawables, we can convert these to WebPs, which reduces the image sizes even smaller. And we don't need to compress them at build time like PNG crunching. So if you can go through and convert them all WebP first, we, we, we get the build times even faster by converting, the, uh, by converting them beforehand. And here's an example of how to do it real fast. So basically you right click on your drawable folders where your PNGs are located and you say convert to WebP. It's very simple. You can compare the preview of the previous PNG to the new WebP. Uh, it should be, uh, should be lossy encoded so you don't have any degradation of any quality. Another freebie, which I mentioned a few times, is Instant Run. So you can basically Instant Run will swap out, hot swap certain codes and do cold swaps uh, depending, depending on what you changed and can help you develop your apps and iterate even faster through the IDE. And sometimes it can even do this without even restarting your current activity. So we can go through the preferences under build execution deployment and simply toggle on and enable instant run. And there's some other features there as well. Now something I, um, I've saved to last, which I use um, heavily at work, I don't, especially when you're behind a VPN and remote, you don't, you don't necessarily want to iterate through and sit there and download dependencies every single time, especially if they're already cached. You want to take a look step back and say to yourself, hey, how can we avoid doing this every single time? So we can use greater loo dash dash offline. That's how, you run it, uh, that's how you run it via command line. But we can also do, it, do the, uh, the IDE. Where I found this especially helpful is when you already have all your dependencies cached, you're on a multi-dex build, so it's pretty big, and you're writing espresso tests. So you have to build the APK and then the test APK. If you don't want to have to sit there and read, you know, go through the configuration, check the dependency checks, using dash dash offline greatly improves this because you're iterating through the compile slash implementation configuration and the Android test compile slash Android test implementation configuration each time. But we can avoid this. So it basically skips the dependency resolution and downloading and just use your cache directly. So we can use it via command line to run unit tests and build the app, but if you want to run individual tests and you don't feel like typing out connected check and passing in the implementation args, you just want to use the IDE directly, it's easy to turn on offline mode via the IDE. So what now? We, we've gone through, we talked about resources, we talked about uh, Gradle properties, optimizing Gradle, build out Gradle files, we talked about an optimizing Android Gradle plugin DSL. What can we do now? What, what, what is left? There's a few more things I didn't mention, but there's a few things that we can go on. So when, I should have mentioned at the very beginning, but I want to mention here at the end, I thought it was more appropriate at the end. So we, after we applied all these fixes, ideally we want to run Gradle profile or Gradle scan beforehand to get kind of a, uh, a baseline of where we were before, and then go ahead and profile it afterwards. That way we can sit here and optimize what we can do moving forward. So Gradle Lou dash dash profile is built in, and I'll show you an example of that soon. And Gradle Lou dash scan, uh, I provide the link here, is an incredible scan tool that allows you to it will take all the information from your build and show you what you can do to toggle on or fix in your current build. And there's another link here I provided for the Gradle Profiler, which they provide tons of different ways, and I'm talking to you about, about how to optimize your builds. So here's what a basic uh, profile looks like when you're profiling. So this is a basic example of Gradle Clean, a simple debug dash dash profile. It creates a nice printout. It gives you a summary of the times, obviously the total build time there, and the task execution, and you can figure out and pinpoint what's taking so long. Ideally, your configuration, we talked about this before, it needs to be about one second or less, hopefully. Dependency resolution times, hopefully these are already cached off beforehand. And your task execution times, that's the most important part. You want to click on that tab, dig deep in there, and figure out what's going on, what, you know, what are the longest running tasks, how can we minimize these. Um, Grail scan is like on steroids. It's even better than profile. It's even better. Uh, I believe in starting 4.3.4, they're going to actually bake this in, but if not, you can still go to... Um, the repo and, and actually apply that plugin to your, uh, to your builds and actually run a scan and actually come out with a big scan report. So to wrap up, I just want to show you the results one more time. So this took, this is, we did this like uh, chunks over time and I'm going to aggregate all the data together. Our builds used to be from anywhere from 18 to 20 minutes and we reduced these about 11 minutes. There's a few other things we're working on right now that I didn't include in this talk. Um, this is op uploading artifacts you know, the APKs, if you're taking screenshots during your test, you know, what are you doing between test to test test? Um, but so far, with this right here, we were able to, uh, uh, you know, get our build time down by 
And uh, that's all I have for you today.